Tonight, we tell you the story of Carlton Hazelrig. He was a world-class athlete who won six different NCAA wrestling titles. Carlton was so good, in fact, that officials had to create a rule named after him to level the playing field for other players. In 1989, he was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers, even though he didn't play football in college. Known as Rig by his teammates, Carlton played five seasons in the NFL and went to the Pro Bowl in 1992. This is where Carlton's story takes a tragic turn. While playing pro football, he suffered at least 20 concussions. After retiring, he started showing signs of cognitive decline, which led to full-blown dementia. Tragically, Carlton passed away last year at the age of 55. Despite the clear connection between his football injuries and his health problems, Carlton and his family were denied compensation as part of a $1 billion settlement between the NFL Players Association and the league. Carlton was disqualified because of an evaluation practice known as race norming. We'll hear from Carlton's wife, Michelle Hazelrig, in just a few minutes. We're talking about race norming in the NFL, I'm joined now by Carlton's wife, Michelle Hasselrig, also with David Langfitt, head of NFL concussion litigation at Locke's Law Firm. Uh, he's personally represented more than 8,000 former players and their families, including the uh, Hasselrigs. All right, welcome, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. One correction. I am on with my own firm called Langford PLLC. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. So, Michelle, to you first. Um, you know, when you see pictures of Carlton during his time a as an athlete, he looks strong, healthy. Um, it's hard to imagine him passing away before. I mean, I mean, 55 is such an early age. When did you first start to notice that something wasn't right with your husband? Um, when I first started was probably in his uh, 40s, early, like late, maybe late 30s, early 40s. And, and tell me more about that. What were you um, noticing? What, what, was, what I noticed was I would ask him to like go to the store for me or do something and he would called me back several times and said, you know, what, what did you want again? Where am I supposed to go again? Um, he would mm -hmm. lose money, um, lose keys. Um, I would constantly have to repeat myself like over and over again till it really started getting noticeable. To now, just tell me about me the time. Uh, tell me about the time you noticed um, blood on your husband's head, something he seemed to be unaware of. Um, this was actually maybe a month before he died. Um, I came in the house and uh, we had opened a taco shop and I was um, working because it was the grand opening and I come in and said that mm -hmm. he asked me how my day was and we were talking. He bent down like this to like scratch his ankle and right here on the top of his head was blood and I you know immediately he's like Carlton what happened he's like what are you talking about I said you, you have blood on your head he literally thought I was lying told me that he did not have it and then when I took him to the mirror to show him and got the napkin you know to show him the blood he immediately said to me um I don't know. I don't, he don't. I said, where did you fall at? He didn't know. He couldn't remember. He didn't even think he did fall. And he fell so wow. bad to where um, when we took him to the doctors, he had bleeding on the brain. So Carlton first met with, with doctors back in 2017, correct? Where he got evaluated um, as part of the NFL CTE settlement. What was that process like for your husband? Um, I had drove him down there to uh, Silver Springs, Maryland. Uh, we had to see two doctors that day. Uh, the first doctor last a couple hours. Um, the second doctor last 20 minutes. Uh, it was it, it was excruciating. They asked me questions. They asked Carlton questions. The one that lasted a whole bunch of hours did. And the one who lasted 15 minutes, I couldn't even really tell he said. Carlton, uh, or, I'm sorry, David, let me bring you in. Um, Carlton was denied 
uh, compensation because of a practice known as race norming. Now, we touched on it briefly, but uh, you're the expert here, so can you give us more of a breakdown of what the practice actually is and, and why it's it makes it harder for black athletes uh, to qualify for any settlement payouts? Well, it involves presumptions. And the whole issue of race norming arose to actually to help people not hurt them. It arose out in San Diego at the University of San Diego, California, uh, University of California, San Diego, for the purpose of making sure that people from underserved backgrounds where there was no preschool, where there was no extensive education, or there was just no family, were not presumed to be um, some, you know, brain damaged or um, mm -hmm. uh, have a, um, a, some sort of disease. And I think that this was meant to help those people so they wouldn't be typed as having Alzheimer's when they in fact did not have Alzheimer's, or that they were typed as mentally retarded when they were not mentally retarded at all. And so this was actually a, a serious clinical concern. Um, and so race norming was used to protect certain kinds of people who came from underserved areas and, and lacked a certain amount of um, family structure, educational structure that many of us benefit from. But in this case, um, in a compensation system like this, race norming is wholly inappropriate. And I think that it's been demonstrated time and again uh, by many lawyers, but also many players and their wives um, that in fact, when you rescore their tests, with the Caucasian mm -hmm. norms. And it's an, very important to understand that there are really only two norms. The Caucasian norms apply to everybody except African Americans. They, have, they apply to Inuit Americans. They apply to Hawaiian Americans or Samoan Americans or Americans of every imaginable stripe except African Americans. And so by applying these norms, that actually tilt the playing field against the African-American players, you're disadvantaging them to a great degree. And just to give you two examples, we rescored Carlton's tests, and Carlton's tests created a, there were a, there's a dramatic swing between Carlton's um, neuropsychological tests done in Silver Spring back in 17, and the rescoring using Caucasian norms. Um, so much so that arguably he does qualify. He comes very close to qualifying, mm -hmm. or he qualifies in certain ways, maybe not to the maximum degree, but he definitely qualifies. And there's, there are other players that I represent who have a similar situation where, just like Carlton, when they got their scores back, they didn't think anything of it because they were told they did not qualify. But when rescored, they clearly did qualify. And using Caucasian norms, which apply to every single NFL player save the African-American players, which I've certainly never done a survey, but I would imagine that the African-Americans make up a majority, possibly quite a large majority of the retired players. This is, um, it's, it makes no sense, first of all, because the entire population either graduated from college or spent at least three years in college. So there's absolutely no reason to have a different set of scoring that would disadvantage the majority, possibly a super majority of players in this situation. Oh. And so while I'm not well, going to get into the mechanics of the scoring, it, there's no question it's discriminatory and there's no question it's wrong. So, David, the NFL has said that, um, that cases like Carlton's are few and far between, something that you have disagreed with. How many former and current athletes have been affected by race norming? It's hard to say. Um, I believe that this could be a very large mistake. And just like as we see through the settlement process, there's the NFL has already paid $870 million in claims, or they owe $870 million. Maybe not all of it is paid yet. But that, the NFL thought that they were going to pay $675 million in the space of 65 years. And we're now at the year four, the year four mark, and they paid 870. So I don't think that the NFL's ability to estimate anything in connection with this problem that NFL retirees face 
is reliable. And I would not rely on the NFL to say that this, they, I, I wouldn't rely on their minimization of this problem. We don't know yet. But the idea yeah. that the vast majority of the NFL retirees are subject to race norming that clearly disadvantage them, uh, it's hard to believe that this is not a substantial problem that needs a substantial solution. And if it wasn't substantial, then there would be no reason to stop the practice. And the NFL did stop the practice for obvious reasons. So um, they have committed David, to stop next? the practice, and I can tell you the judge yes. is angry about it. Wow. Um, what's next for Michelle's case for 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 this whole thing legally? I think that for Michelle's case, we're very hopeful. We we know that the judge ordered mediation. We know that the judge recently issued an order from which I infer she is angry, um, that there better be some sort of deal coming up on the 15th of October or she's going to take other steps. Um, we support Judge Brody's urgency in this way. I think that a lot of people like Michelle have waited a long time. She's not alone. Mm -hmm. But I think that the mm -hmm. prospects of Michelle, Michelle's case is very interesting and unique. Carlton died um, without knowing um, three years after he was tested that he actually had qualified. And therefore, simply rescoring the tests may not be enough. And so we are looking, um, particularly for a man who has died, to have some sort of reasonable compensation for Michelle as his sole heir and the uh, executor of his state. Um, to see what happens. But we would like to see, and we're very hopeful, that the resolution um, that is uh, ordered uh, by the judge in this case is something that we can work with. But we don't know what it will be, and we do not know when we will see it. And we're very eager to see it, Mich and we're eager to get justice. Michelle, last question to you. Um, your husband sure. accomplished so much in his life. Um, he was clearly beloved by his community. I mean, he coached uh, high school football and wrestling and, and mentored so many young men throughout his life. Um, he was a husband, father. What do you hope that Carlton's legacy will be? I just hope that his, everybody will remember Carlton as being a very humble, genuine guy. He was uh, the type that didn't really uh, brag about, you know, his accomplishments and escalates and everything that he's done. Um, he's a good guy, and I want everybody else to know that I am going to stick behind my husband and fight for him through this. All right, Michelle Hasselrig, David Langfit, thank you both so much for your time.